Hi guys, it's a wonderful morning and I just wanted to say howdy. Now we're going to be doing chapter three in The Great Gatsby. So if you take a look, we have chapter three open. We also have our questions open because we're super smart like that. And here we go. Chapter three, The Great Gatsby. There was music from my neighbor's house through the summer nights. In his blue gardens, men and women came and went like moths among the whispering and ch champagne and the stars. At high tide in the afternoon, I watched his guests diving from the tower of his raft or taking the sun on the hot sand of his beach, while two motor boats slit the wa waters of the sound, drawing aquaplanes over the cataracts of foam. On weekends, his Rolls Royce became an omnibus, bearing parties to and from the city. Between nine in the morning and long past midnight, while his station wagon scampered like a brisk yellow bug to meet all the trains, and on Monday eight servants, including an extra gardener, toiled all day with mops and scrubbing brushes and hammers and garden shears, repairing the ravages of the night before. Every Friday five crates of oranges and lemons arrived from the fruitier in New York. Every Monday these same oranges and lemons were left in his back door in a pyramid of pulpless halves. There was a machine in the kitchen which would extract the juice from a hundred or two hundred oranges in a half an hour if a little button was pressed two hundred times by the butler's thumb. At least once a fortnight, a corps, a corps of caterers came down the several hundred feet of canvas and enough colored lights to make the Christmas tree of Gatsby's an enormous garden. In buffet tables garnished with glistening hors d'oeuvres, spiced baked hams crowded against salads of harlequin designs and pastry pigs and turkeys bewitched to a dark gold. In the main hall, a bar with a real brass rail was set up and stocked with gins and liquors and with cordials, all long forgotten that most of his female guests were too young to know one from the other. We're going to stop right there because that kind of gives us a uh, little idea of what kind of parties we're having here. Now, of course, um, alcohol is legal at this time and him having a ton of it's kind of, hmm. Now, a cordial is actually a very very light liqueur it's really really fruity in flavor and normally you can't really taste the alcohol in it on the other hand you know bathtub gin which is basically what this is is um if y'all heard the moonshine so the thing is is that he when he says this he's like so some of these ladies were being intoxicated or made intoxicated sorry by their uh dates for the evening so this was kind of a moralist place let us continue by seven o'clock the orchestra arrived no thin five-piece affair but a whole pitful of oboes and trombones and saxophones and violas and coronets and piccolos and low and high drums the last summers have come in sorry the last swimmers have come in from the beach now and are dressing upstairs. The cars from New York are parked five deep in the drive, and already the halls and salons and verandas are gaudy with primary colors, then the hair shorn to a strange new ways and shawls beyond the dreams of Castile. Um, one of the new things at this time is girls cutting their hair very, very short in a bob. Mm, up until this time, women wore their hair long all the way to their death. So the older you were, the longer your hair was. And then they would braid and pin it so that it would be short and comfortable in the summer. So they're saying that, you know, these are very young people that are coming in. And then we have, uh, the... Sorry, gaudy with primary colors and their hair shorn, strange new wears, and shawls beyond the dreams of Castile. Um, at this point, um, beading is a huge deal in fashion. Everything is beaded, and what is called, um, ooh, wait one second, Miss Barr is actually going to have to look something up real quick. I'm back. It's called carnival glass. Carnival glass is an iridescent type of glass that there that was created at this time and was really, really expensive. Nowadays, if you can find the stuff, literally it's worth hundreds of dollars. And beaded purses and shawls at this time now run for about two to three thousand a piece. Now let's go take a look at our chapter three. First question: Describe the extravagance of Gatsby's parties. So at this point, at this point, we can actually start describing there is a ton of food and there's liquor and there's oranges in New York, which is super expensive. 
And all of these people stay all summer and pretty much feast off of Gatsby's generosity. And then at the end of each weekend, there is a huge pickup with all of these servants working double time trying to fix the house once it's been destroyed. So let's head on over. The bar is in full swing, and floating rounds of cocktails permeate the garden outside until the air is alive with chatter and laughter and casual innuendo and introduction forgotten on the spot, and enthusiastic meetings between women who never knew each other's names. The lights grow brighter as the earth lurches away from the sun, and now the orchestra is playing yellow cocktail music and opera voices pitching a key higher. Laughter is easier, minute by minute, spilled with the... Okay... Bar stuff just went black for a second. So sorry, guys. I evidently caused my own screen problem. Go bar. Anyway, sorry, guys. Back to our reading. So the big thing here is that we're taking a look at the prodigality of the entire thing. The fact that he's using like a lot of money. It's really wasteful how much he's spending just for these people's entertainment. And it's not like it's a one time affair, like a wedding. This is like every weekend for the entire summer. So Nick is looking at this going, how much money does this man have? You know, when does it actually ever run out? Sorry, back where we were. I'm oh, sorry. They use the word prodigality. Okay, sorry. Laughter was easier minute by minute, spilled with prodigality, tipped out of a cheerful word. The groups change more swiftly, swell with new arrivals, dissolve and form in the same breath. Already there are, t are wanderers, confident girls who weave here and there among the stouter and more stable become for sorry become for a sharp joyous moment the center of a group and then excited with the triumph glide on through the sea <laughs> sea change of faces and, and voices and color under the constantly changing light so we have to see that there's all of these like different colored lights and so they these women would sit there and try to get as much attention as humanly possible so they would walk among people and then become the center of attention and enjoy it and then move on to get another person's attention which is kind of showing you that they are a little bit flirty but they're also extraordinarily um narcissistic a little self-centered so let's take a look how this how this continues. Suddenly, one of these gypsies is trembling opal, seizes a cocktail out of the air, dumps it down the, the, for courage, and moving her hands like Frisco, dances out alone on the canvas platform. A momentary hush, the orchestra leader varies his rhythm obligingly for her, and there is a burst of chatter as the erroneous news goes around that she is Gilda Gray's understudy from the Follies, the party has begun. So we also have some like second rate well, celebrities that are showing up. I believe that on the first night I went to Gatsby's house, I was one of the few guests who had actually been invited. People were not invited. They went there. They got into the automobiles, which bore them out to Long Island, and somehow they ended up at Gatsby's door. Once there were, they were introduced by somebody who knew Gatsby, and after that, they conducted themselves according to the rules of behavior associated with amusement parks. Sometimes they came and went without having met Gatsby at all, came for the party, but with, sorry, with a simplicity of heart that it was its own t ticket of admission. I had been actually invited. A chauffeur fur in a uniform of robin's egg blue crossed my lawn early Saturday morning with a surprisingly formal note from his employer. The honor would be entirely Gatsby's, it said, if I would attend his little party that night. He had seen me several times and had intended to call on me long before, but a, pe 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 a peculiar combination of circumstances had prevented it. Signed, J. Gatsby, with a majestic hand. Dressed up in white flannels, I went over to his lawn to, and, he, okay, flannel is a type of material. He doesn't mean that he's going out in pajamas. Um, this was a lightweight cotton material that was used for summer clothing because, again, there is no AC. Sorry, dressed up in flannels, I went over his lawn a little after seven and wandered around rather ill at ease among the swirls and eddies of people. 
I didn't know, though here and there was a face I noticed the co- uh, noticed on the commuting train. Okay, when he uses swirls and eddies, pardon me, he uses as often, like often throughout this. Um, Fitzgerald's going to use water to describe tides of people, huge numbers of people moving backwards and forwards. He describes them as the ocean. Now we have this entire ideology that the ocean is a beautiful thing, but it is also a very destructive thing. And keep that in your mind as we continue. I was immediately struck by the number of young Englishmen dotted about, all well-dressed, all looking a little hungry, and all talking in low, earnest voices to solid and prosperous Americans. I was sure that they were selling something, bonds or insurance or automobiles. They were at least agonizingly aware of the easy money in the vicinity, and convinced that it was theirs for a few words in the right key. As soon as I arrived, I made an attempt to find my host, but the two or three people for whom I I asked his whereabouts stared at me in such an amazed way and denied so vehemently any knowledge of his movements that I slunk off in the direction of the cocktail table, the only place in the garden where a single man could linger without looking purposeless and alone. I was on my way to getting roaring drunk from sheer embarrassment when Jordan Baker came out of the house and stood at the head of the marble steps, leaning a little backward, looking with contemptuous interest down at the garden. Welcome or not, I found it necessary to attach myself to someone before I could begin to address cordial remarks to passers-by. Hello, I roared, advancing out toward her. My voice seemed unnaturally loud across the garden. I thought you might be here, she responded absently as I came up. I remembered you lived next door to. She held out a hand impersonably as a promise that she'd take care of me in a minute, in a minute and gave, e- gave ear to two girls in twin yellow dresses who stopped at the foot of the steps. Hello, they cried together. Sorry you didn't win. That was the golf tournament. Ah, we now know Jordan is a golf player. She had lost in the finals the week before. You don't know who we are, said one of the girls in the yellow, but we met you here about a month ago. You've dyed your hair since then, remarked Jordan, and sat down, and the girls had moved casually on, and her remark was addressed to the premature moon produced by the, the, sorry, produced like the supper, no doubt, out of a caterer's basket. With Jordan's slender golden arm resting in mine, we descended the steps and sauntered about the garden. A tray of cocktails floated at us through the twilight, and we sat down at the table with two girls in yellow and three men, each one introduced to, uh, to us as Mr. Mumble. "'Do you come to these parties often?' inquired Jordan to the girl beside her. The last one was the one I met you at, answered the girl in an alert, confident voice. She turned to her companion. Wasn't it for you? Wasn't it for you, Lucille? It was for Lucille, too. I like to come, Lucille said. I never care what I do, so I always have a good time. When I was here last, I tore my gown on a chair, and he asked me my name and address. Inside of a week, I got a package from a courier's with a new evening gown in it. Can you keep it? asked Jordan. Sure I did. I was going to wear it tonight, but it was too big in a in the bust and I had to have it altered. It was glass oh, sorry, gas blue with lavender beads. Two hundred and sixty five dollars. There's something funny about a fellow that'll do a thing like that, said the girl eagerly. He doesn't want any trouble with anybody. Who doesn't? I inquired. Gatsby. Somebody told me, the two girls and Jordan leaned together confidently, somebody told me they thought he killed a man once. A a thrill passed over us. The three Mr. Mumbles bent forward and listened eagerly. I don't think it was so much that, argued Lucille skeptically. It's more that he was a German spy during the war. One of the men nodded in confirmation. I heard that from a man who knew all about him. Grew up with him in Germany, he he assured us positively. Oh, no, said the first girl. It couldn't be that, because he was in American army during the war. As a cred... <laughs> Sorry. Do, do, do. As our credulity switched back from her, she leaned forward with enthusiasm. You look at him sometimes when he thinks nobody's looking at him. I bet he killed a man. She narrowed her eyes and shivered. Lucille shivered. We all turned and looked around for Gatsby. It was a testimony to the romantic speculation he inspired that there were whispers about him from those who found little so who found little that it was necessary to whisper about in the world. 
So he's basically saying, since these people are loud and verbose and they talk about everything, it's really kind of strange that they're all whispering about Gatsby. And now we have, okay, now we have the, is he Kaiser Wilhelm's family? Is he a German spy? Was he an American war hero? Is he a murderer? And there's all of these rumors going around and nobody knows. But everybody drinks his liquor and parties at his house. The first supper, there would be another one after midnight, was now being served, and Jordan invited me to join her own party who were spread around a table on the other side of the garden. There were three married couples and Jordan's escort, a persistent undergraduate given to violent innuendo, and obviously under the impression that the sooner or later Jordan was going to yield him up her person to greater or lesser degree. Instead of ram- rambling, this party had preserved a dignified homogeneity and um, su- sorry, and assumed to itself the function of representing the stolid nobility of the countryside. He's basically saying, this guy came because he thinks he's going to get with Jordan, but in reality, no. It's kind of strange because even though there's a lot of different people there, they seem to be sticking with whatever class that they're in. East Egg, sorry, East Egg, conciding to we- uh, sorry, condescending to West Egg, and carefully on guard against the spectroscopic gaiety. Let's get out, whispered Jordan, after somehow wasteful and inappro- inappropriate half hour. This is much too polite for me. We got up, and she explained that we were going to find a host, and we never I had never met him, she said, and it was making me uneasy. The undergraduate nodded in a cynical, melancholy way. The bar, where we had fir- we had glanced first, was crowded, but Gatsby was not there. She couldn't find him from the top of the steps, and he wasn't on the veranda. On a chance, we tried an important-looking door and walked into a high Gothic library, paneled with carved English oak and probably a transported complete from some ruin overseas. A stout middle-aged man with enormous aloe-eyed spectacles was sitting somewhat drunk on the edge of a great table, staring with an unsteady concentration at the shelves books. As we entered, he wheeled excitedly around and examined Jordan from head to foot. What do you think? he demanded impetuously. About what? He waved his hand towards the bookshelves. About that. As a matter of fact, you needn't bother to ascertain. I ascertain. They're real. The books? He nodded. Absolutely real. Have pages and everything. I thought they'd be nice, durable cardboard. Matter of fact, they're absolutely real. Pages and here, let me show you. Taking our spectacism for granted, he rushed to the bookcases and returned with volume one of the Stoddard Lectures. See, he cried t- t- triumphantly, it's a bona fide piece of printed matter. It fooled me. This fellow's a regular Beliasco. It's a triumph. What thoroughness, what realism. Knew when to stop, too. Didn't cut the pages. But what do you want? What do you expect? He snatched the book from me and replaced it hastily on the shelf, muttering that if one brick was removed, the whole library was liable to collapse. Who brought you, he demanded, or did you just come? I was brought. Most people were brought. Jordan looked at him alertly, cheerfully, without answering. I was brought by a woman named Roosevelt. Yes, that Roosevelt. He continued, Mrs. Cloud Roosevelt. Do you know her? I met her. Somewhere last night. I've been drunk for about a week now, and I thought it might sober me up to sit in the library. Has it? A little bit, I think. I can't tell yet. I've only been here an hour. Did I tell you about the books? They're real. They're... You told us. We shook our heads at him gravely and went back outdoors. So we're stop right there. This is a really strange foreboding interlude. This one right here gives us a little taste of what's going to happen later. Now, what he's saying is that normally libraries were used. Now, if you bought books, especially older books, or especially extraordinarily well fine bound books, they did not cut the pages. The pages were actually still attached together. And then you would use a library knife to cut the pages apart so that you could read it. The fact is, is that this entire library, as he says, he thought it was a fake because it's all so new. But when he went through, yeah, he bought the books. Yes, he put them on the shelves, but they never cut the pages. 
So he's trying to point out that the library is fake. It's not something that's been passed down or something that's been lovingly collected. It was something that was purchased in order to look good. You can actually do that now. If you want, you want the look of old books, you can actually go online and buy stocks of old books just so that you can put them on your shelf. They're not titles you would ever want to own or read. And none of them are worth very much. But it's just to make people look impressed by the fact that you have them. Let us continue. There was a dancing now on the canvas in the garden. Old men pushing young girls backward in eternal graceless circles. Superior couples holding each other tri triumph tri sorry, tortu um, torturously, fashionably, and keeping in the corners. The great number of single girls dancing individual individualistically or rele sorry, relieving the orchestra for a moment of the burden of a banjo or the traps. By midnight, the hilarity had increased. A celebrating tenor had sung in Italian and a notorious contra alto had sung in jazz and been, the new, been between the numbers of people who were doing stunts all over the garden. While happy... <laughs> vacuous bursts of laughter rose across the summer sky uh, sorry stunts what they mean by stunts is at this time there was really kind of strange you guys know how there's internet challenges it was exactly the same thing um sorry guys you thought you're original but you're not what they did at this time is people would do just outrageous things like take chairs and bounce them on the tops of flagpoles and sit in them and then take photographs of it and they would be put in magazines and newspapers and then other people would completely rip them off and do it in their hometown. So when he's saying this, you know, some of these things are kind of dangerous. People are extremely drunk. And of course, they're waiting for their second supper. Second supper is being served at mid after midnight in order to try to sober up the guests. Let us continue. Sorry. A pair of str the pair uh, a pair of strange twins who were turned out to be the girls in the yellow did a baby act in costume and uh, and champagne was served in glasses bigger than finger bowls and the moon had risen higher and floating in the s and floating in the sound was a, tri a triangle of silver scales trembling a little into the stiff t a tiny drip of banjos on the lawn. I was still with Jordan Baker. We were sitting at a table with a man of about my age and a rowdy little girl who gave way upon the slightest provocation to an uncontrollable laughter. I was enjoying myself now. I had taken two finger bowls of champagne and the scene had changed before my eyes to something significant, elemental, and profound. At a lull in the entertainment, the man looked at me and smiled. Your face is familiar, he said politely. Weren't you in the third division during the war? Why, yes. I was the 9th Machine Gun Battalion. I was in the 7th Infantry until June 19, 1918. I know I'd seen you somewhere before. We talked for a moment about some sweet, gray little village in France. Eventually, he evidently, he had lived in this vicinity, for he told me that he had just bought a hydroplane and was going to try it out in the morning. Want to go with me, old sport? Just near the shore along the Sound. What time? Any time that suits you best. It was on the tip of my tongue to ask his name when Jordan looked around and smiled. Having a gay time now, she inquired. Much better. I turned again to my new acquaintance. This is an unusual party for me. I haven't even seen the host. I live over there. I waved my hand to the invisible hedge in the distance. It's this man's Gatsby sent over his chauffeur with an invitation. For a moment, he looked at me as if he failed to understand. I'm Gatsby, he said suddenly. What? I exclaimed. Oh, I beg your pardon. I thought you knew, old sport. I'm afraid I'm not a very good host. He smiled understandingly, much more than understandingly. It was one of those rare smiles with a quality of eternal reassurance in it that you may come across four, four or five times in your life. It faced and seemed to face the whole external world for an instant and then in concentrated on you with an irresistible prejudice in your favor. I understood you just so far, sorry, it understood you just so far as you wanted to be understood, believed in you just as you would have believed in yourself, and assured you that it had precisely the impression of you that <laughs> at your best, and you hoped to convey. Precisely that point in, it vanished, and I was looking at an elegant young roughneck, a two 
or one, uh, sorry, a year or two over thirty, whose elaborate formality of speech just missed being absurd. Some time before he introduced himself, I got a strong impression that he was picking his words with care. Almost at the moment when Gadsby identified himself, a butler hurried toward him with an, the information that Chicago was calling him on the wire. He excused himself with a small bowl that included, uh, sorry, a bow that included each of us in his turn. If you want anything, just ask for it, old sport, he urged me. Excuse me, I will join you later. When he was gone, I turned immediately to Jordan, constrained, <laughs> constrained to assure her of my surprise. I had expected that Mr. Gatsby would be a florid, sorry, florid or cor <laughs> corpulent person in his middle years. Who is he, I demanded. Do you know? He's just the man named Gatsby. Where's he from, I mean? And what does he do? Now you're starting on the subject, she answered with a smile. Well, he told me once that he was an Oxford man. That's uh, Oxford College in uh, England. A dim background started to take shape behind him, but with her next remark it faded away. However, I don't believe it. Why not? I don't know, she insisted. I just don't think he went there. Something in her tone reminded me of the other girls. I think he killed a man. I had the effect of simulating my curiosity. I would have accepted without question the information that Gatsby sprang from the swamps of Louisiana or from the Lower East Side of New York. That was com comprehensible. But young men didn't, at least not in my provincial experience, I believe they didn't, drift coolly out of nowhere and buy a palace on Long Island. Anyhow, he gives large parties, said Jordan, cha changing the subject, and with an, oh, sir, Urbane distaste for the concrete. And I like large parties. They're so intimate. At small parties, there isn't any privacy. There is a boom of the bass drum, and a voice of the orchestra leader rang out suddenly above the achala of the garden. Oh, sorry, guys. Ladies and gentlemen, he cried, at the request of Mr. Gatsby, we are going to play for you Mr. Vladimir Tustoff's latest work, which attracted so much attention at Carnegie Hall last May. If you read the papers, you know where there was a big sensation. He smiled with jovial condensation, con condensation and said, Some sensation, whereupon everybody laughed. The piece is known, he concluded lustily, as Vladimir tests off jazz history of the world. At this particular time, jazz is considered like rap is considered today uh the ideology that it is some people believe it's not really music some people thought that it was a fad and it would go away but just like rap in the 1990s it took it became its own musical icon and it moved forward the nature of Mr. Testoff's composition eluded me, because just as it began, my eyes fell on Gatsby standing alone in the marble steps and looking from one group to another with approving eyes. His tan skin was drawn attractive, sorry, attractively tight on his face, and his short hair looked as though it was trimmed every day. I could see nothing sinister about him. I wondered if the fact that he was not drinking helped to set him off from his guests, for it seemed to me that he grew more correct as the fraternal hilarity increased. When the jazz history of the world was over, girls were putting their heads on men's shoulders in a puppyish, <laughs> convivial way. Girls were swimming backwards playfully into men's arms, even into groups knowing that someone would arrest their falls. But no one swooned backward on Gatsby, and no French bob touched Gatsby's shoulder, and no singing quartets were formed with Gatsby's head in one link. I beg your pardon. Gatsby's butler was suddenly standing beside us. Miss Baker, he inquired, I beg your pardon, but Mr. Gatsby would like to speak to you alone. With me? she exclaimed in surprise. Yes, madam. She got up slowly, raising her eyebrows to me in astonishment, and followed the butler towards the house. I noticed that she wore an evening dress. All of her dresses, like sports clothes, were, had, were, were as jauntless, jauntless about her movements as she had first learned to walk upon the golf course on clean, crisp mornings. I was alone, and it was almost two. For some time, confused and intriguing sounds had issued from the long way windowed room which overhung the terrace, eluding Jordan's undergraduate, who is now engaged in obstetrical conversation with two chorus girls, and who 
implored me to join him, I went inside. The large room was full of people. One of the girls in yellow was playing the piano, and beside her stood a tall, red-haired young lady from a famous chorus engaging in song. She had drunk a quantity of champagne, and during the course of her song, she had decidedly ineptly she had decided ineptly that everything was very, very sad, and she was not only singing, she was weeping too. Whenever there was a pause in the song, she filled it with gasping, broken sobs, and then took up the lyric again in a quivering soprano. The tears coursed down her cheeks, not freely, however, for when they came into contact with her heavily beaded eyelashes, they assu ooh, assumed an inky color and pursued the rest of their way down the slow, back in slow black rivulets. A humo humorous suggestion was made that she was singing the notes on her face, whereupon she threw up her hands, sank into a chair, and went off into a deep, vinous sleep. So, vinous meaning uh, alcohol-induced. Now, it's rather interesting, like, okay, so everybody started off kind of quiet, and then things got really, really loud, and then things got really, really loud, and everybody's partying, and then now the party's starting to wind down, and we have people are happy drunk and sad drunk and pass out drunk and this lady's sad drunk and poor Tom is just kind of watching this all unfold. She had a fight with a man who says he's her husband, explained a girl at my elbow. Says he's her husband? I looked around. Most of the remaining women were now having fights with men. <laughs> men said to be their husbands. Even Jordan, um, even Jordan's party, the quartet from East A, were rent asunder by desertion. One of the men was taking, talking with curious intensity to a young actress, and his wife, after attempting to laugh at the situation in a dignified and indifferent way, broke down entirely and resorted to flank attacks. At intervals, she appeared suddenly at his side with an angry diamond and hissed, You promised! into his ear. <laughs> The reluctance to go home was not confined to wayward men. The hall was presently present occupied by two deplorously sober men and their highly indignant wives. The wives were sympathizing with each other in slightly raised voices. Whenever he sees them having a good time, he wants to go home. Never heard anything so selfish in my life. We're always the first ones to leave. So are we. Well... We're almost the last tonight, said one of the men sheepishly. The orchestra left an hour ago. In spite of the wives' <laughs> agreement that such malevolence was beyond credibility, the dispute ended with a, in a short struggle, and both wives were lifted, kicking into the night. As I waited for my hat in the hall, the door of the library opened, and Jordan Baker and Gatsby came out together. He was saying some last word to her, but the eagerness in his manner tightened abruptly into formality as several people approached him to say goodbye. Jordan's party were calling impatiently for her from the porch, she, but she lingered for a moment to shake hands. We've just heard the most amazing thing, she whispered. How long were we in there? Why, about an hour. It was simply amazing, she repeated abstractly, but I swore I wouldn't tell it. And here am I, here I am tantalizing you, she yawned gracefully in my face. Please come and see me. Phone book under the name Mrs. Sigourney Howard, my aunt. She was hurrying off as she talked. Her brown hand waved a jaunty salute as she melted into the party at the door. Rather ashamed that I, that on my first appearance I had stayed so late, I joined the last of Gatsby's guests who were clustered around him. I wanted to explain that I had hunted for him early in the evening and apologized for not having known him in the garden. Don't mention it, he enjoined me eagerly. Don't give it another thought, old sport. The familiar expression held no more familiarity than the hand which was reassuringly brushed my shoulder. And don't forget, we're going up to the in the hydroplane tomorrow morning at nine o'clock. Then the butler behind his shoulder, Philadelphia wants you on the phone, sir. All right, in a minute. Tell them I'll be right there. Good night. Good night. Good night. He smiled, and suddenly there seemed to be a pleasant significance in having been among the, the last to go. So if he would, had desired it all the time, good night, old sport. Good night. But as I walked down the steps, I saw that the evening was quite uh, were not quite over. Fifty feet from the, from the door, a dozen headlights illuminated a bizarre and tumultuous scene. In the ditch beside the road, right side up, 
but violently shorn of one wheel, rested an old coupe which had, le had left Gatsby's drive not two minutes before. The sharp jut of a wall accounted for the detachment of the wheel, which was now getting considerable attention from half a dozen curious chauffeurs. However, as they had left their cars blocking the road, a harsh discor discordant din from those in the rear had been audible for some time, and added to the already violent confusion of the scene. There was a car accident. A man in a long duster had dismounted from the wreck, and now stood in the middle of the road, looking from the car to the tire and from the tire to the observers in a pleasant, puzzled way. See, he explained, I went in the ditch. The fact is infinitely astounding to him, and I recognized first the unusual quality of wonder, and then the man. It was the late patron of Gatsby's library. How did it happen? He shrugged his shoulders. I know nothing whatsoever about mechanics, he said decisively. But how did it happen? Did you run into the wall? Don't ask me, said Owl, Owl, Owl Eyes, washing his hands of the whole matter. I know very little about our driving. Next to nothing. It happened. That's all I know. Well, if you're a poor driver, you ought to try. Dr not, you oughtn't try driving at night. But I wasn't even trying. He explained indignantly. I wasn't even trying. An odd hush fell on the bystanders. Do you want to commit suicide? You're lucky it was just a wheel, a bad driver, and not even trying. I. You don't understand, explained the criminal. I wasn't driving. There was another man in the car. The shock that followed this de declaration found a voice in a sustained, Ah! As the door of the coupe swung slowly open, the crowd, it was now a crowd, stepped back involuntarily. When the door had opened wide, there was a ghostly pause. Then very gradually, part by part, a pale, dangling individual stepped out of the wreck. Pawing tentuously on the gra at the ground with a large, uncertain dancing shoe, blinded by the glare of the headlights and confused by the in incessant groaning of the horns, the, appara the apparition stood swaying for a moment before he perceived the man in the duster. "What's the matter?" he inquired calmly. "Did we run out of gas?" "Look!" Half a dozen fingers pointed to the amputated wheel. He stared at it for a moment, and then looked upward as though he suspected it had dropped from the sky. It came off, someone explained. He nodded. At first I didn't notice we'd stopped. A pause, then taking a long breath and straightening, his shoulders he remarked in a, dis a determined voice, Wonder if he'll tell me where there's a gasoline station? At least a dozen men, some of them a little better off than he was, explained to him that the wheel and the car were no longer joined by any physical bond. Back out, he suggested for a moment. Put her in reverse. But the wheel's off, he hesitated. No harm in trying, he said. The caterwauling horns had reached a crescendo, and I turned away to cut across the lawn towards home. I glanced back. A wafer of a moon was shining over Gatsby's house, making the night fine fine as before, and surviving the laughter and the sound of his shrill, growling, glowing garden. His sudden emptiness seemed to flow now from the windows and the great doors, endowing, sorry, endowing the complete isolation of the figure of the host who stood on the porch, his hand up in a formal gesture of farewell. Reading over what I had written so far, I see I have given the impression that the events of the three nights, the three nights several weeks apart, were all absor absorbed. So there were all that absorbed me. On the contrary, they were merely casual events in a crowded summer, and until much later, they absorbed me infinitely less than my personal affairs. Most of the time, I worked. In the early morning, the sun threw my shadow westward, and I hurried down the white chasms to Lower New York, to the Pro sorry, Probidity Trust. I knew I knew the other clerks and young bond salesmen by their first names and lurched with them to the dark crowded restaurants on the little pig sausage sorry <laughs> and lunched with them in dark crowded restaurants and little pig sausages and mashed potatoes and coffee. I even had a short affair with a girl who lived in New Jersey City and worked in an accounting department, but her brother began throwing mean looks in my direction. So when she went on vacation in July in July, I let it blow quietly away. I took dinner usually in the Yell Club. For some reason, it was it was the gloomiest event of my day. And when I went upstairs to the library and studied investments and securities, and for a conscientious hour, 
there were generally a few rioters around, but they never came into the library, so it was a good place to work. After that, the night was mellow, and I strolled down Madison Avenue, past the old Murray Hill Hotel, and over to 32nd Street, Street to Pennsylvania Station. I began to like New York. A racy, adventurous feel in it ha sorry, it at night, and the satisfaction that the constant flicker of the men and women and machines gave the restless eye. I liked to walk up Fifth Avenue and pick out romantic women from the crowd and imagine that in a few minutes I was going to enter into their lives, and no one would ever know or disapprove. Sometimes, in my mind, I followed them to their apartments in the corners of the hidden streets, and they turned and smiled back at me before they faded through the door into warm darkness. An enchanted metropolitan mid-twilight, I felt a haunting loneliness sometimes, and felt it in others. Poor young clerks who loitered in front of the windows, waiting until it was time for the solitary restaurant dinner. Young clerks in, a du in the dusk, wasting their most poignant moments of night, of night and life. Again at eight o'clock, when the dark lines in the forties were deep, five deep with throbbing taxicabs, bound for the theater district. I went sinking in my heart. Forms leaned against each other in the taxis as they waited, and voices sang, and there was laughter from unheard jokes, and lighted cigarettes, and un outlined, unintelligible gestures inside, imagining that I, too, was hurrying towards a gaiety, and staring their intimate excitement, uh, sorry, sharing their intimate excitement, I wished them well. Let's take a moment and answer some questions. Wrong one. There we go. Okay, what distinction does Nick make between himself and the other attendants of Gatsby's party? Um, they all seem to be really enjoying this. They all are there to meet other people and have a good time. And Nick is kind of feeling uncomfortable because he doesn't know everybody. He doesn't really think that they're very interested in getting to know other people. He feels almost um, out of the circle because in one part group of the party these are all the guys that are partiers from new york they found out about this and they show up they don't know gatsby they're not high end they are not sophisticated they're not rich but they come to party and on the other is everybody who's really rich and affluent and they know gatsby throws a good party and they go and so nick's in between that he has rich family he doesn't know anybody in uh west egg he's not really working class so he's in a position where he's kind of apart from them who does nick meet at the gatsby party that is familiar of course he meets jordan and in meeting jordan we find out that jordan plays golf and we also know that she just really likes a party and it's the only reason why she's going Ah, what happened for Lucille when she tore her gown for the party? Um, when we go back to that piece, we find out that Jordan, of course, uh, sorry, Jordan talks to her and Lucille says, you know, I, I got my dress snagged on a chair here. And when Gatsby found out, he sent her a dress that was $265. So let's go do a little research and find out how much money that actually is. So we're going to go over to Google and we're going to say $265 dollars in 1920 hey isn't that wonderful when those fill in oh so uh 265 dollars in 1920 equals to three thousand six hundred dollars in 2020 oh sorry guys oh my goodness that's some that's that's a dress um so he bought her something designer he bought her something that she wouldn't be able to buy off the rack and of course she t says that it's completely beaded so of course we know that beading equals cash um, what is the owl, owl eye man surprised about? Oh, he's surprised that, of course, the books that are in the library are real, but that they've never been used. They goes, they, this guy's going to quite the lengths to fake being old money. He's going quite the lengths to fake being intellectual. He didn't just get a library and stock it with fake books. He actually bought real books, but we know he never read them because they're not open. Oh, sorry, we skipped five. My bad. What secrets or rumors are told about Gatsby? Okay, so thus far, it's he's Kaiser Wilhelm's family member, and that's where he got his money. He's a German spy. He killed a man. 
Um, he was actually an American war hero. There's all of these things that are still going around and we really haven't set it down. What we do know is that he and Nick at least looked at each other and knew each other from the war. So we know that those two were in the war together. Uh, what, Ga what, sorry. Oh, where does Gatsby recognize Nick from? The war. Um, the, what nickname does Gatsby use for Nick? Oh, we talk about, it. he says, you know, old sport, old sport, old sport. And of course that is supposed to be a high, like a hearkening or a clue that he is English. Ah, why does Gatsby leave Nick, Nick's company? He gets a call from Chicago and then later on he gets a call from Philadelphia. So, and the butler is very like, they, you know, very hush hush about it. So we think that this has something to do with his business dealings. Okay, what did Gatsby tell Jordan that she didn't believe? We, we don't know yet. Oh, no. What did Gatsby... Totally. Ignore Barr. Um, what did Gatsby tell Jordan she didn't believe? Gatsby told her that he was from Oxford. That he had attended college in England. And she's like, I don't believe that. But then he does this old sport thing, which tries to like tie back to, I went to college in England. Uh, why does Jordan like large, par large parties? Because small parties, everybody's watching you and they can see what you're doing. Large parties, you can sneak away. She says that they're more intimate because you don't have everybody watching you. Uh, what happens to the couples at the end of the party? Okay, we got a lot going on there because we've got women are fighting with their husbands and then crying. And then we've got husbands having to pick up their wives and drag them away from the party. And we have everybody's like literally, you know, fighting and getting angry with each other at the end. And so while they were happy drunks when everybody was festive, now things have gotten a little bit ugly. What situation is Owl Eye in when Nick sees him? Okay, so they've had this car accident. This is going to come up later. They have this car accident where they shear off an entire wheel from the axle. And the guy who's driving is like, I wasn't driving. Sorry, Owl Eye was like, I wasn't driving. And the guy who was actually driving was like, I wasn't even trying to drive. It just happened. And it's this, you know, I, there's no penalty for me. There's nothing that I did. It just happened. Now, strangely enough, this attitude is prevalent still to this day. There are celebrities who have killed people using their cars and not spent a day in jail. And it is, well, this was just an accident. And this is literally the beginning of some of that. And they're, he's saying, oh, I, I don't know what happened. It just happened. It's an accident. Well, no, man, you were driving, you turned too fast, hit a wall and like decapitated a wheel from your car. That's not an accident. But this particular attitude is going to be prevalent. So make sure you notice it now. If I were you, I'd seriously like put this page number in red. It's going to come back to haunt you. Here we go. Ah, and then what is um, Nick's normal day-to-day -day life like? He says it. These particular instances, which he is talking about right now, are just really, like, far apart. And that normally, day-to-day, -day, it's just him going to work, eating, bra eating dinner, going to study at night, coming back and doing it over and over again. His day is kind of monotonous. Now, I'm going to pause real quick because I have a phone call coming in. Sorry, guys. Mr. McElroy just sent his the video that I sent to you guys to all of his students. <laughs> now I get to scare everybody. Now, here we go. Sorry, my bad. Um, okay, number 16 we are not at yet. So please, let's go back to our beautiful, wonderful book. For a while, I lost sight of Jordan Baker. And when I am in midsummer, I found her again. At first, I was flattered to go places with her because she was a golf champion and everybody knew, everyone knew her name. Then it was something more. I wasn't actually in love, but I felt sort of tender curiosity. <coughs> the bored, haughty face that she turned to... Sorry. The bored, haughty face that she turned to the world concealed something. Most affectious, uh, affections 
conceal something eventually. Even the, uh, sorry, affectations, sorry, conceal something eventually. Even though they didn't in the beginning. And one day I found that it, what it was. When we were in the house party together up in Warwick, she left a borrowed, she left a borrowed car out in the rain and the top with the top down and then lied about it. And suddenly I remembered the story about her that had eluded me from the night at Daisy's. At her first golf tournament, there was a row and nearly reached newspapers. <coughs> a suggestion that she had moved her ball from a bad lie in the semifinal round. The thing approached the proportions of a scandal and then died away. A caddy retracted his statement, and only other witnesses admitted that he might have been mistaken. The incident and the name that had remained together in my mind. Ah, oh, Jordan's a cheater. Jordan's a liar. Jordan Baker instinctively avoided clever, shrewd men, and now I saw that this was because she felt safer on a plane where only any divergence from the code would be thought impossible. She was incurably dishonest. She wasn't able to endure being at a disadvantage, and given this unwillingness, I suppose she had begun dealing with subterfuges when she was still very young in order to keep that cool, insolent smile turned to the world, and yet satisfy the demands of her hard, jaunty body. It made no difference to me. Dishonesty in a woman is a thing never blame deeply. I, you never blame deeply. I was casually sorry and then forgot. It was on the same house party that, sorry, it was on the same house party that we had a curious conversation about driving a car. I started because, it started because she had passed so close to some workman. Our fender flicked the button of one of the man's coats. You're a rotten driver, I protested. Either you ought to be more careful or you ought to not drive at all. I am careful. You are not. Well, other people are, she said lightly. What's that got to do with it? They'll keep out of my way, she insisted. It just takes two to make it it takes two to make an accident. Suppose you met somebody just as careless as yourself. I hope I never will, she answered. I hate careless people. That's why I like you. Her grey, sun stayed eyes stared straight ahead, but she had deliberately shifted our our relations. And for a moment I thought I loved her. But I am slow thinking and full of interior rules that act as breaks in, on my desires. And I knew that first I had to get myself definitively out of that tangle back home. I had been writing letters once a week and signing them Love Nick. And all I could think of was, was how, when a certain girl played tennis, a faint mustache of persper perspiration appeared on her upper lip. Nevertheless, there was a vague understanding that had to be tactfully broken before it was free. So basically saying, well, maybe I could marry Jordan. Jordan's got money. Jordan's cool to hang out with. But I am kind of keeping this other girl on a string back home by saying, love Nick in my letters. And maybe I should kind of make sure that she understands we're broken up before I go after Jordan. Everyone suspects himself of at least one of the cardinal virtues, and this is mine. I am one of the few honest people I have ever known. Really now? Okay. <sighs> oh, our last question. Oh, no, let's go back. What does Nick realize about Jordan Baker? She is an utter freaking liar. She lies about everything. He says that she probably got, you got into the knack of it when she was young to get out of being in trouble with her parents and it kind of just never died out and then what is the tangle back home that is the entire you know best friend who's a chick who he's been writing letters home to saying i love you and maybe he doesn't really love her but he doesn't want to like not have her so i'm just gonna keep this going <sighs> now what is <laughs> nick say his one cardinal virtue is he says he's super honest I don't know about that. We're going to have to like discuss that one. That might be our very first big Zoom question. Is Nick honest? Hmm. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, hints is what's coming up next. Got serious love. Talk to you later. Be good. Bye.